So after watching day for night, I hope you now understand what I mean when I say that everything is fake. But one type of film that most people don't think about in this way is documentary. Is everything in a documentary real? Does a documentary always have to tell the truth? Another way to think about this question is, is everything that you see on the news real? Not necessarily, right? Sometimes people get things wrong. Sometimes people lie. Just because it's a documentary doesn't mean it's always true. Doc to me, at least, documentaries are just another kind of film. They come with more expectations. We expect that the filmmaker should be sharing something that they believe is true. Um, but again, there are always exceptions. Uh, there have been documentaries about how documentaries are not always true. A very famous documentary is uh, one made by Orson Welles called F for Fake. At the beginning of the movie, he says that the next 120 minutes will be true. The problem is that the movie goes for 130 minutes. And in the last 10 minutes, he lies. Um, so in this hour, I want to talk to you about three special topics in cinema, documentaries, animation, and if we have time left, desire. OK, documentaries. So um, there are four main things to know about making a documentary. Sometimes uh, documentary filmmakers try to capture something that is currently happening. A lot of the celebrity documentaries, the Billie Eilish documentary, the Taylor Swift documentary are made like this. The filmmaker chooses a subject and if they're lucky something will happen that's worth making into a movie this could be entertaining uh, entertainment it could also be politics um, a few weeks ago um, alexei navalny was killed the opposition leader in russia uh, but in 2021 2022 there was a documentary about his life uh, and the filmmakers just thought, you know, this is an important person. We, something might happen. Um, what the filmmaker did not know is that soon after making the documentary, Navalny was poisoned by Vladimir Putin. Uh, this was really big news a few years ago. Um, so um, if you want to make that kind of documentary, it's half skill, right? You have to choose uh, an interesting subject but it's also half luck. And there are many documentary filmmakers who follow somebody around or who follow some kind of issue and nothing happens and they have wasted their time and money. These kinds of documentaries are called fly on the wall documentaries because it's like the filmmaker is a fly on the wall looking at everything that's happening. If it goes well, these are great documentaries, but if it doesn't go well, uh, it's just a, lot, a waste of time and money, nothing happens. So the other popular kind of documentary is the historical documentary about something in the past. So uh, if it's in the past, that you need a way to present the story. If you read it, it's just words. But if you make a movie, you have to think, what do I want to show my audience? So the traditional boring kind of historical documentary you probably see on TV. Uh, you present a topic, you present some photographs, right? You get some experts and you interview them uh, and it's presenting information to the audience. But it's boring. So uh, one way to make a historical documentary more entertaining is by doing reenactments hire some actors to perform the situation in front of the camera. Um, Reenactments can use professional actors 
they can also use the actual documentary subject. And this is what they do on the news, the TV news all the time. Like um, if you've seen a news report about like a famous traditional restaurant, they've been open for 500 years, same family, and they make their food in the traditional way. So of course the news will show you how do they make the food. You'll have a shot of like the, the chef cutting things and then boiling things, right? That's not for any customer. That's for the filmmaker. They're performing it for the filmmaker. It might be exactly how they do it, but it's not in the situation where they have to. It's a performance. It's also a reenactment. Uh, there can be some tricks with interviews also, right? You grab an expert, you interview them, but some people are not at good, uh, as good at public speaking as I am, right? Some people uh, hesitate. Some people don't perform well in front of the camera. Sometimes the, the answer that they give is not the answer that you want. You have to kind of guide them, right? So if you present the actual interview, it can be kind of boring, confusing, misleading. So what they do is they use sound editing. They do something with the sound. First, they introduce the guy or the person. Right? You have a shot of them talking, answering a basic question. But when they go into more detail, then you have footage of something else. Like, uh, for example, if you're making a documentary about a historical building and you have an expert on this building, right? You sit them down, you ask the questions, they start answering and then the image shows different parts of the building. Maybe the expert is talking about the doors. So you show the image of the doors. Then they talk about like the first floor, the second floor. So you show images of the first floor, the second floor. What you don't know is that even though you're still hearing the expert talk, that sound is often edited. The, edit, the sound editor cuts out the boring parts, cuts out the empty parts, and puts together something that feels natural and fluent and convincing. In fact, if you watch these kinds of documentaries, you can tell if they're doing this. All you have to do is close your eyes. When you see the expert on screen, the interview will sound kind of choppy, not very smooth. But as soon as the image cuts to somewhere else, your ears will hear them talk fluently and naturally. That's editing. Uh, and then the third main strategy in making a historical documentary is, of course, to present evidence. Usually this is textual evidence. Most of history is written down. So how do you present words in a film? There are a couple ways. The most popular way is to show the document and then hire somebody famous to read key lines from the document. But if the history is not too old, you can even get somebody from that time to read the evidence in front of the camera. And in that case, you get an added benefit. Somebody who was there now reading about what people said, and you can get their real reactions to this information. Uh, that's another way to do it. Uh, but if the um, text is short and clear, you may not even have to get somebody to read it. You can just put it on screen for like five seconds, six seconds, and let the audience read it. You can help them by like highlighting key points if you want. Um, but the point is, even when you're watching a documentary that feels true, that feels natural, that feels convincing, it's not simply somebody bringing a camera and shooting what's there. There's always filmmaking in a documentary. So even for a documentary, there will be writers. 
even a fly on the wall documentary where the guy is holding a camera and following somebody famous will have a writer. The writer's job in that case is to look at all of the information we have and how do we arrange a story out of this information. And so a, docu a documentary will always have an editor, a sound editor. I've seen documentaries with Foley artists. Uh, so even in a documentary, they are recreating sounds to go with the images. Uh, some uh, documentaries will always, will almost always have uh, VFX artists, right? Every word or like text or like special effect you see on screen, somebody has to do that. Uh, and if the reenactment involves uh, something dangerous, like maybe they're acting out of fight, then a documentary can also have a stunt coordinator. Uh, so really, when it gets down to it, you know, I write film reviews uh, professionally, semi-professionally, but whenever I read other reviewers' uh, takes on documentaries, I always feel like a lot of them are so focused on, is this real, is this true, is the story important? Whereas I feel like even if the story itself is not important, if the filmmakers made a good movie, I still think it's a good documentary. Um, but that's my personal opinion. Um, so as I said, you can make a documentary about many different things, including about uh, things that are not true or not always true. There are some documentaries that don't just record, they also create. It's a documentary about something that the filmmakers made happen. Uh, the most famous example is uh, about five years ago, there's a movie called The Act of Killing. An American documentary filmmaker went to Indonesia. Uh, I don't know if you know this, in the 70s, the Indonesian government basically killed off all of its communist uh, political um, opponents. Not arrested, just killed. It was a series of massacres, Tusa. And even today, Indonesian history does not really talk about this, uh, like in school or in public. So the filmmaker went to Indonesia. He found some of the soldiers and police working for the government at that time. And he asked these people to reenact what they did to their opponents and their prisoners. So on the service level, it looks like a historical documentary. But the reason that this documentary won an Oscar for best documentary is because the filmmaker didn't just capture what happened then, he also captured how these people feel about it now. Right? If you are a professional killer for the government and the government never punishes you, nobody ever punishes you, and now somebody comes and makes you relive that part of your life, how would you react? Would you be able to understand why you are guilty? Would you feel like the filmmaker is wasting your time? That is the key interest of this documentary. It's something that the filmmaker made happen. It's not just a record. Uh, another example of this kind of documentary uh, I saw this just last year. There's a movie called, there's a documentary called Kim's Video. Uh, it's about a video store in New York City that was closed down because uh, not enough customers, but there was a huge selection of rare and hard to find movies. So what did the store owner do with those movies? He held an online auction and the organization that won the auction was a small town in Italy, which nobody expected. What would a small town in Italy do with all of these rare movies? But the mayor of the city said, don't worry, we'll put up a museum, we'll take care of your rare movies. So the store owner said, okay, fine, here you go. And the movies disappeared. The filmmaker went to the town, found out what happened to those movies, and stole them back to the US. 
So again, it's not just a record. It's something that the filmmaker himself did on camera. Um, I really like that movie because it's 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 pretty obviously illegal. And the movie had like three lawyers working on it. Uh, I'm still not sure how he got away with it. OK, so that's documentaries. They can be boring, they can be interesting, uh, but they are always a product of filmmaking. Not everything is fake, but most of it is fake. OK, next topic is animation, and it's important for you to understand this for reasons that are related to this course and your grade. I'll let you think about that. So uh, usually we can talk about animation as uh, 2D animation or 3D animation. I'll do 3D animation first because it's easier. 3D animation is exactly like making a real movie or uh, sorry, a live action movie, except um, everything happens in a computer. So you still have actors and objects and backgrounds and settings and locations. You still have camera and lighting and special effects, but all of it is digital. All of it is simulated, more needed. So uh, what happens is after you have a story idea and you want to, you have a, like a character design, environment design idea, then you have to first create the characters. Uh, now you get more freedom than a live action movie because the characters don't have to look human. Uh, even if they're human, they don't have to look human. Um, so you can decide how you want to create this three dimensional character. Uh, same with the backgrounds and the objects, um, usually defined as um, objects are things that will move and the background is things that will not move or that will move in a way that is not under the control of the character. Like. Uh, um, if the weather, the, char the character probably cannot control the weather. It will change, it will move, but it's not according to what the character does. So after you have created everything, then you have to define how do you make them interact. In daily life, if I pick up something, like if I pick up a pen, that's it, right? I use my body, I pick it up, it comes up. But if you're doing this in a computer, there are many different ways to do this, and you have to decide how do I want the hand to affect the pen? How do I want the pen to affect everything else? This is called a physics engine. Uh, this is also the same technology they use for video games. Uh, and sometimes the physics engine can be very, very complicated. Uh, about Eight years ago, there was a movie called Entangled, Mofa Chiren. You guys know this one? So I think it's a Disney movie, right? The princess had really, really long hair. That hair was a nightmare for the filmmakers um, because they, the focus is on the hair, right? This is the selling point of the movie. So it can't just be like a blob and it, it does everything at the same time. They wanted to make every single hair independently affected by the physics. Um, and so most of the time was spent on animating the hair, deciding how does it uh, interact with the wind, with the water, with people, with objects. Um, so 3D animation is often focused on that kind of detail. Interactions, movement. It doesn't have to be realistic, but it has to be convincing. You have to believe it. Or if you're not supposed to believe it, there should be a good artistic reason for that. OK, 2D animation is, uh, of course, older before computers. I'm sure you guys know the logic of 2D animation is uh, you take a bunch of drawings, right? And each drawing is slightly different from the previous one. So if you uh, put like, if you show them one after the other very quickly, it looks like it's moving. This is exactly the same logic as live action filmmaking. When you take a film camera, you're actually taking 24 pictures every second, right? We talked about this last week, 24 frames per second. And when you play the movie, you are showing these images very quickly one after the other. So some film scholars say that 
animation is the original filmmaking. So uh, again, in uh, animated movies, you have to differentiate between which parts are going to move all the time, which parts are only going to move some of the time, and which parts are not going to move. Uh, so for example, um, for the character, you might have like a hundred different drawings uh, to show movement, but for the background that changes nothing, you can have one drawing. And what they do is, or uh, today they do this all on the computer, but in the past what they did was they have like a, a setup, they have a rig, and you would put like the background layer on the in, in glass on the bottom, and then uh, the layer that moves the second least in glass on top, and then each layer will move more until you get to the top layer. Uh, I remember like when they made the first um, Snow White, they had like nine layers. And then after you put everything together, you take a camera and you shoot from top. Uh, and so they take a photo and then they switch out the drawing and then take another photo, switch out the drawings, and they do that until they have the whole movie. Which is very, very annoying the uh, a lot of work. Uh, and this is why animated movies are n not necessarily cheaper. If you make a live action movie, you have to pay for the set, the objects, the, the actor's time, the everything. But if you make an animated movie, it takes more people, more work, and that also costs money. So like if you read or hear about like this great animated movie, like a, like a Miyazaki movie, Gong Chi Jun. Why do people uh, care so much about how it looks, how it moves, how it feels? Because in fact, these are handmade illustrations and pictures, but not just once, right? Hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, and so an animator doesn't just have to make a good single picture, they have to make a good series of pictures that actually go together and move in convincing ways. Uh, some cheaper animations don't move in convincing ways. Uh, when's the last time you guys went to see Detective Conan, Conan, like a movie? Uh, so like Conan movies recently have become action movies, but even then there are quiet moments, people are talking. But if you pay attention, you'll realize that they're like if somebody is walking. It doesn't feel smooth. It feels like one picture after the other. They're doing Kakata, um, and that's probably because the filmmakers are saving time and money. Instead of using 10 pictures to show somebody walking, they use five pictures. We can still know what's going on. It just doesn't feel that smooth and natural. Um, I guess maybe they think it's because the, the Conan movies are supposed to be for kids and kids don't really care too much about the art. I don't know. Um, and of course, now even when you go see a 2D animated movie, um, especially for the action shots, there it will often use CGI and a computer to do 3D animation. Like uh, uh, Girls in Panzer, right? Song uh, Zanzer. When they're talking and when nothing is really happening, it's 2D. But when they're in a tank fight, it's 3D. Okay, that's animation. If you want to, you can make an animated short film for the semester. Uh, I don't know if it will be more work or less, but you can if you want to. Uh, and same for documentary. If you want to make a short documentary, uh, you can also do that if you want to. OK, and then we have a little time left. We have a lot of time left. Uh, so the last topic I want to uh, discuss with you is desire. There are many kinds of desire. Uh, some people say that movies are all about desire. If you think about the story, it's always about something that the character wants and they feel like they have to have it. Sometimes it's about uh, the character doesn't want anything. It's everybody else 
who wants something from the character. And so the desire of the main character is to be left alone. In peace. Um, but there's also an effect of desire on the audience. Because think about it. Some people say that a film camera is supposed to be the audience perspective. It's like uh, if you're in the room, this is what you see. But is that really true? Not really. In a movie, you can cut between different angles, but in real life, you can't jump between different places to look at the same scene. So it's not exactly uh, what a real person would see. But the idea is similar. The fact that the actors never look into the camera means that when we are looking at them, it's like we're secretly looking at them. It's like we're voyeurs. So when you have a movie about uh, private moments, intimate moments, uh, moments in someone's life that they would not show to anybody else, we have that feeling of uh, we get to see inside of them in a way they would never let anybody see. Uh, and in the early days of cinema, this was very closely connected with desire, especially with uh, male desire for women. Um, so like um, in the early days of cinema, you know, back in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, people really cared about uh, wearing proper clothes when they go out. Um, if you've seen the TV show Mad Men, uh, the main character is an advertising executive. When he gets to his office, he takes off his shirt and he puts on another white shirt. Because in those days, uh, there was more air pollution. And so in order to present a clean shirt that doesn't have like polluted smell, he would keep a brand new shirt in his office. So back in those days, people really cared about this stuff. Um, and also like, uh, um, like in older movies, you know how every man is always wearing a suit jacket or some kind of coat or jacket. They're always wearing something on top of their shirt. Uh, and this is because if you were only wearing your shirt, not even like a private shirt, but like a, a regular button up shirt, that would be considered private clothing. So you can imagine in the early days of cinema when we saw people at home wearing whatever, this was considered very scandalous. People are thinking, oh, I, you know, I don't know these people. Why are you showing me like dressed improperly? Um, but especially for the tradition of cinema that came from uh, erotica and pornography, this is very closely connected to desire, especially if you show a woman at home wearing whatever. Um, of course, today's cinema is slightly less sexist, um, but that history lives on in the images that we see. And it's also why uh, usually we want actors to look great, right? Beautiful men, hands, handsome women, or the other way around, um, especially in a movie related to romance and love. When's the last time you saw a romantic comedy with an ugly actor or actress? I can't remember a single one because the point is not to show you real life. The point is to show you a life that you could want, a story that you want to see, that you want to experience. Uh, one way of saying this is you want to spend two hours hanging out with these beautiful people. That's also audience desire. Um, and so you can see that desire, even when we don't talk about sex and nudity, desire is a key part of the movies. Um, but when we start to talk about sex and nudity, then we have to mention that uh, for much of the 20th century, movies were made for men. Uh, in the sense that when a, a film shows characters on screen, especially when they're taking off their clothes or 
or uh, interacting in like a sexy way. Especially in like from the 50s to the 70s, movies cared more about showing the female body and showing male reactions to the female body. And this, we're going to watch like some older movies in this class, and this will be very obvious. One reason it will be very obvious is because uh, we usually don't do that too much today. Sometimes still, but it's not as obvious as in the past. Um, this is called the male gaze, 男性注视. The idea that the camera is not just showing us secrets, it's showing men secrets about women. Um, and so for a long time, uh, female audience members um, did not feel like these movies were made for them. And so when a female filmmaker did make a movie that radical, considered new, considered uh, by production studios, maybe they, it won't make enough money. Um, so like even today, there's a lot of talk about, oh, uh, you know, like this movie is uh, made by a woman starring women. It's like a female superhero movie or whatever. Uh, and the reason people talk about this is because of that uh, movie history. Now, I do have to say, not every movie made by a woman for women starring women is a good movie. That should be obvious. Um, but it is true that especially Hollywood production studios still kind of believe that if you make a movie for women, it will make less money. Um, and this is kind of the same logic with like uh, supporting Taiwanese movies. If you actually go to the theater and watch Taiwanese movies, I mean, some of them are great, but like a lot of them are not. And yet uh, people still like to go pay money to watch them because uh, we feel like it's important to support Taiwanese filmmakers to show that when you put uh, when you let somebody in Taiwan make a movie, there will be an audience. People will pay money uh, and that they can continue to make movies. It's a similar logic for like uh, movies for and about women, movies for and about like people who are not white, not men, not straight. Um, but that's changing and it's been changing a lot in the past 10 to 20 years. So back to the question of desire. Now that uh, the filmmaking world recognizes the importance of desire, not just for straight white men, we're starting to get uh, more and different kinds of relationships on screen, more and different kinds of sex scenes on screen. Kristen Stewart just made a movie called Love Lies Bleeding. It's playing at the Sundance Film Festival uh, that I hear has some really crazy gay scenes. Sex isn't just about the characters in the movie or having sex, uh, enjoying themselves and having fun. Sex can be a symbol of a relationship. The way that two people behave together in bed can tell you more about how they feel about each other, how they think about each other, how much they respect each other, how much they care about each other, can show us so much more than a simple scene of them having breakfast or like talking. And this is why films, even today, when, you know, if you want to see sex, you can find it everywhere online. Filmmakers still use sex scenes. It's not like in the past when uh, sex was harder to find. Some uh, filmmakers made pornography because there was an audience for that. People were some people were willing to pay for that. Uh, but today you can find that stuff everywhere. So sex scenes have become more about the characters and the story and the symbolism and the feeling. Uh, and now not so much about like the excitement for the audience, if that makes sense. Um, so again, the movies that we are going to watch starting from week four, I have not seen before, but I'm going to assume 
that we're going to see at least one sex scene, probably. Um, so you can keep these ideas in mind uh, the next time you see characters in a movie having sex. There's a reason, hopefully, hopefully there's a reason uh, for that to fit into the story, and it's supposed to give us more information about the story and the characters. Unless it's a bad movie. OK, do you have questions about these three topics? Documentaries, animation and desire in movies. OK, so next week we're going to watch a documentary about filmmaking in the digital age. A lot of what we saw today is now done using computers. Not all of it, like some filmmakers still love to do this kind of thing, right? Christopher Nolan famously says, I only use real special effects. Which is not true, uh, but most of it is real special effects. Uh, so this stuff is still important to know. But today most people just use computers. So next week the documentary will be about that change uh, from like real celluloid physical film to everything being done using digital cameras on a computer. Uh, and then after watching the documentary next week, I will let you form your small groups. Uh, and you can use that time to start talking about what kind of short film you want to make. Okay, see you next week.